Do you know which fish was around during the Jurassic period with the dinosaurs and is still here today? Do you know which fish species breathe air and breathe in the water? Would you like to sight fish for one of these ancient fish and see the amazing colors that will blow you away? Drew Price is here. He's a primitive fish hunter and Lake Champlain master. He's going to take us into one of the most unique fisheries you're going to find in the lower 48. This is the Wet Fly Swing Podcast, where we show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare, and what you can do to give back to the fish species you love. Hey, I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a young kid. I grew up around a fly shop and have created now one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in this country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers from around the country than just about anyone on this planet. Today, Drew Price is going to give us his three tips to find and catch primitive fish on a fly. You'll find out how to pull a boat and to get in position and how you can find those fish. You're going to learn how to target these fish in the thick weeds and some of the muck. And you're also going to find out which extreme temperature is just right for bowfin. Plus, Drew is going to uh, make a pitch for you to think outside the box and find that oddball fish species you should target in your local waters this year. Another great species, another fish species that we're going to be checked off of our virtual bucket list today. Here we go. Drew Price from MasterClassAngling.com. How are you doing, Drew? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Good, good. Yeah, this is this is going to be a fun one. I think we're going to talk today uh, partially about a species that I think um, many of us have heard about, bowfin, and uh, and some other species, and also uh, some of the waters. I'm sure most of the people have heard about. We're going to dig into that and maybe some other species you you fish for out there. Um, and uh, but before we get into all that, let's take it back into your fly fishing. How did you first get into it? What's your first memory? Uh, well, I got into fly fishing in late 1993 when I graduated from college and my parents got me a fly rod outfit. That's what I'd asked for. And, uh, and I, I graduated in December. So I started, uh, I started, you know, trying to fly fish and, you know, not being very successful, learning how to fly cast, getting out in the snow and just casting in the snow and, uh, quickly bought a a fly tying kit to try to do something over the winter. And, um, and that spring, I guess it was probably in, in early May. That was the first time I finally caught something. I got, I got about a three pound small mouth. Uh, and I was like, this, this is it. Hmm. <laughs> this is what I've been looking for. You know, I'd been spin fishing for quite a while and I wanted something different and I wanted to be able to, to, you know, expand what I was doing and, and do something that had a little bit more of a challenge to it. And, um, you know, it just, it, it struck a chord, um, and, and being able to tie the flies too, you know, like, uh, I've got a degree in studio art and, and I'm, I'm very, really good with my hands and, and I'm always looking for, you know, kind of crafty hobby kind of things to do. And boy, that just like the combination of the two things. And I'm also, I've been really involved with, or for a long time. I was really involved with aquariums and aquarium fish. So like everything came together all at the right time. And, and it just became a lifelong passion. Wow. You know, that was 31 years ago now. Yeah. 31 years ago. Wow. Ni- yeah. 93. And then what was the, so where was that first fish caught? What, what uh, water body? That was the Saranac river in Plattsburgh, New York. Oh, in New York. Okay. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. And, and is that where, uh, or so where did you, is that where you grew up or what's your, maybe you could talk about where you grew up and then where you are now. So I grew up in a little town uh, called Constable, which is about eight miles from the Canadian border in Northern New York. And then I went to school at SUNY Plattsburgh and I, in 1998, I moved over to Burlington, Vermont. And I've been in Vermont ever since. And, you know, I, uh, I have fished water, you know, my, my home water's range pretty much all over Vermont and Northern New York. Um, I, I fish and guide both, um, both that, uh, you know, fish for right from the get go, right from the, the very beginning with a fly rod. I was like, what can I catch with this? You know, I, I wasn't limited to, I never limited myself to just trout. Mm-hmm. 
I was like, I got it. I want to get panfish. I want to get, you know, like there's all these carp around. I want to fight, figure out how to get these guys and, and both in and, and pike. I, you know, I've been obsessed with pike since I was a kid, pike and musky. Um, I've been, you know, I got my first musky in 1995 on a fly. Wow. You know, I've been doing the musky game on a fly for a real long time at this point. And, um, you know, I was, I was doing musky in a fly when people are like, you're doing what, <laughs> right. you know, now it's like, it's, it's normal. Everywhere. Yeah. Everybody, it's, it's one of their norm- bucket list species now. Right. Right. Back when I was doing it, people, were, I mean, I, I remember being a float tube on, on, on Lake Champlain at a, at a river mouth, uh, fishing pike. And, uh, and this guy looks at me, he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I was like, I'm fly fishing for pike. He goes, you can't do that. You can't, you can't do that with a fly rod. And I was like, people catch tarpon on fly rods. Yeah. Why can't I catch pike on a fly? Yeah. You know, and I was, I was, you know, it took me no time to figure out pike on a fly, you know, and, um, uh, and the float tube was a lot of fun and, uh, but I'll never do float tubes. No, <laughs> I don't think I'll do float you tubes. Flo- have you done float tubes in a while? Have you been, when was the last time you were in a float tube? Uh, I was in a float tube a couple of years ago. Oh, nice! And uh, and and it was it, it was to access a pond that uh, that I you know you can't really access. I didn't have any other way of accessing it, and I got into I got a float tube out and and got in it, and I was like, yeah, you know, this is fun, but I I remember why I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, it's it's cool. It's definitely a great way to get into backcountry lakes, uh, and and you know some of those. Uh, less accessible body waters, bodies of water. But I'm, you know, I, I definitely like having my feet under me when I'm casting. Um, and, and it, it definitely limits what you can do. Um, uh, and your legs are really tired at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, they are. That's right. That's cool. Wow. So, so you got some pike early and, uh, and I think bowfin is definitely one we want to focus on. I mean, you've got a yeah. bunch of species we could talk about, but I want to start a little bit with the the lake because I mean, this is, you know, we've been focusing a little bit across New York. We were just there in December fishing, um, you know, like near Buffalo, fishing for steelhead, yep. you know, down oh, in yeah. that area. And uh, and that was great. But, I mean, Lake Champlain, I mean, it, it's uh, it's one that I think probably everybody's heard about. What is, maybe describe that. Is it, is it, are there any similarities to that in the other Great Lakes in, in the area? Or just describe it a little bit. Well, so Lake Champlain is a really interesting body of water. And, you know, actually... Its formation is about the same time as the Great Lakes, and technically it is in the same watershed as the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes are all actually the Lake or the uh, St. Lawrence watershed, right? Because they all flow into the St. Lawrence, and Lake Champlain flows into the St. Lawrence through the Richelieu River. You know, Lake Champlain is it's a big lake. It's not the size of the Great Lakes, but it's 120 miles long. Uh, it's about 14 miles at the at the widest point near Burlington. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big water body of water with, uh, you know, at 96 feet above sea level, it's got about uh, seven and a half trillion gallons of water. in it. So it's got a lot, it's got a lot of water and it's, and it's really kind of in five different segments. Um, there's a broad lake, there's Missisquoi Bay, what's called the inland sea, which is entirely within Vermont because we have the, there's the Champlain islands in the Northern part of the lake. And then, uh, you've got Mallets Bay. And then, and then there's the southern end of the lake, which is is riverine, very different than the rest of the lake. Most of the lake is fairly clear water. Uh, you get down below the Champlain Bridge, and that that lower section, which is it, it, it operates like a, a big river, is is pretty turbid. Uh, you get a different mix of species down there. Um, you know, uh, we've got like 87 or 88 species in the lake at this point, which is pretty good number of species. Of that, I would say there's probably 25 to 30 that are catchable on a fly. It's a pretty good number. The Lake Champlain watershed actually has a really interesting history in the f- history of fly fishing in North America. Uh, one of the, the the tributaries to Lake Champlain, uh, the Great Chazy River, which is the northernmost tributary on the New York side, uh, is the first river where a Fish was documented as being caught on a fly rod. In oh wow! 1763, a, uh, a British captain or lieutenant um, was uh, was you know, fishing for salmon because uh, we had 
at that point, there were um, both landlock and sea run salmon runs in all of the tributaries, you know, and, and massive runs. We're talking like there's historic records where uh, it was dangerous to ride a horse across rivers. Oh, wow. When the salmon were in and indentured servants had it in their um, uh, contracts that they wouldn't be fed salmon more than three times a week. So, you know, it, 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 it was a real deal, you know, like the, we had massive, massive salmon runs. Of course, by 1829, uh, all salmonids were wiped out of Lake Champlain. Because oh, wow. Damming, uh, deforestation, pollution, all that stuff. Right. Uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, what's really cool with, with that right now is that there's been a, there was a salmonids restoration program started by the federal government. A, a, a joint venture between the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and uh, New York State DEC. And um, so it was, you know, Salmon and Restoration Program where they started stocking lake trout, landlocked salmon. And, of course, you know, I, you got to restore steelhead and, and brown trout to a watershed that never had them. So <laughs> they were included right. in that program. Um <laughs> It, it, I always think it's kind of funny to, to, to see that those were included in a restoration program. But and when was that? When did they start stocking steelhead? 1975. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there was some stocking before that, but they really started stocking. And, you know, we're talking like a million lake trout a year, which is a huge success story at this point because we have massive natural reproduction of lake trout in the lake now. To, to the point where New York State DC said, we're not going to stock Lakers anymore. And uh, when they're doing studies, anywhere from like 30 to 50% of the fish that they're getting are wild fish now, which is awesome. Uh, we've got an amazing lake trout fishery. We don't get a lot of big fish, but we have a lot of fish. And that's one thing that I, I love. I, like right now, whenever I can get out on the lake, you know, you can get Lakers right now so you can catch lakers on on a fly oh i'm doing it all the time yeah all the time it's one of my favorite things to, to fish for and guide for from late october right into december and if we have open water throughout the the winter i'm i'm after lake trout um and then i get them in the spring again right and is that mainly because the lake's not quite as deep as some lakes where you hear they're they're way down deep and they're hard to get to it's, it's so it's all about water temperature okay those those lakes that they're way down deep that they're hard to get to is because there, people are fishing them at the wrong time. When your water temperature is, when it's below 50 degrees, those fish are all over, right? Um, you know, if, if it's below 45 degrees, I mean, they're in the, the top 10 feet of the water column. No problem. I mostly use a floating line most of the year. Having said that, I can, you know, you can also use a, a full sink line and fish down 40, 50 feet and get Lakers. You know, and that's where electronics definitely come in. And, uh, you know, if you can, if you know where the fish are and, and know how they behave, it's, it's, which isn't difficult because they, they love humps. And if you find those humps and you see them on your, your sonar and you can get a fly down to them, you, you, you're getting into fish. And there's a lot, I mean, the, the fly line technology these days, SA has got some great lines that can get you down real fast. Right. And, and, you know, those guys are great. You know, you hook into one and, uh, you know, it's a smash and grab and then you're, um, and, and even when you're down that low, when, and you're working that low, you know, I love it because it's kind of video game fishing and you can watch this on your sonar, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm dragging the bottom and I hit, you know, I, I can touch the top of the, 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 the hump that they're on. And then I start stripping like crazy and like as fast as I can right to the top, to, right to the boat. And I've had those fish hit right at the boat. So they followed it up 40 feet and smashed wow. it right next to the boat, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, but in the, in the, you know, in the, in the spring of the year, uh, when the water is, is cold and they're on different points and, and in different places, uh, you're just casting out like a game changer, a deceiver, Klaus or whatever, and just stripping it back and, and you'll get into them. But in the fall, that's when you can really get into the numbers game. Um, there's several places in the lake where you get like tens of thousands of them congregating to spawn. And it's and it's pretty awesome. Uh, I love doing that. I, I fish them at night with glow-in-the-dark flies, and, which is really effective. And, uh, and this fall, I started uh, – I started playing the uh, the spay game and and launching out uh, you know long casts and and crashing uh, you know crushing uh, 
Lakers with a spare rod, which mm. is a blast too. Is this off the boat or out off the bank? No, it's um, probably the most famous place to do it is there's there's a jetty up in uh, Grand Isle, Vermont that you can get out on and uh, and, and fish. Uh, this year was pretty dangerous. We had a very, very high lake year. I don't know if you saw the, the flooding that we had here. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. So, you know, our, our lake usually starts off uh, at a lake level after after we get runoff in April, May. It gets to a high of around between 99 and 100 feet uh, after snow melt. And then it drops down after that. And by September, we're usually down to like 93 to 94 feet. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty major drop in water depth. Uh, well, this year, uh, we didn't have a big snow melt. It, it stayed fairly low in the, in the early season. And it was down to about 95 and 95.8 or something like that by, by July when, when we got the floods. And then it stayed at 98.5 feet continuously between July and August, which is unheard of. We don't get a lake level that high. I mean, we're talking the, the amount of recharge to keep that lake at 98 and a half feet for two months in July and August is, is just an unfathomable bold number. Uh, the only thing I can compare it to is when we had a uh, uh, st- tropical storm Irene hit in oh, yeah. 2011, right? And and Lake Champlain went from 96 feet to 98 feet in in two days, uh, and which is a similar situation to what we we had this past summer. Um, and when that went up that much, um, the estimate I saw was uh, about 750 billion gallons of water to bring it up two feet. Now. In the middle of summer, when you got the warm temperatures, you've got winds, you've got the, the Richelieu River running water into to the St. Lawrence, you've got a lot of flow out of that lake. <laughs> to, to keep it at that height, you're just talking about just huge volume of water coming in. Yeah. It was a really, really rainy, summer, really high water summer. Imagine a place where dreams of perfect cast don't break the bank. Welcome to Jackson Hole Fly Company. Dive into a superior online fly shop experience that offers premium fly fishing gear with exceptional quality at affordable prices. Why choose quality and affordability when you can have both? Our dedication, crafting top tier products without the top tier price tags. So gear up for your next adventure and let your wallet breathe easy. Jackson Hole Fly Company, reeling in quality, casting out high costs. Visit them at jacksonholeflycompany.com. Discover Smitty's Fly Box for premium flies. Their monthly subscription service delivers expertly crafted flies and materials tailored to your fishing environment. Boasting over 30 years of experience, Smitty's is your trusted source for a diverse range of flies. Enhance your fishing experience and make life easier with their carefully created selections. You can subscribe right now at smittysflybox.com and join a community of passionate anglers. And so how do bowfin fit into the mixture here? If you talk about, I think probably a lot of people maybe haven't, don't know, they probably heard of it, but they don't know a lot about bowfin. How is, how is bowfin uh, fit into the picture in Lake uh, Champlain? In Lake Champlain. So I think, I think Lake Champlain is one of the best places in the world to find, uh, to find bowfin. And uh, I think it's, it's important to start off with one thing about bowfin. Just uh, two years ago, a scientific paper came out that split the, uh, the bowfin that we have into two different species. So the species that is in Lake Champlain is not the one that we thought it was. Uh, so for years, everybody thought we had Amia calva, which is the is the type, you know, the, the original bowfin species that we thought was out there. But through genetics and morphometric analysis of the fish that are out there, there's actually a fish called Amia acelicata, which is the, the bowfin species we have. And they get more colored up than that southern bowfin. Get, they call them an eye spot bowfin because we get a really they get the males develop these beautiful spawning colors. They they get this like orange belly. They get a their fins go turquoise. They get a oh, forest wow. green stripe down their side when they're when they're guarding their nest and and the eye spot they get this 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 yellow circle around their black. Um, ocelli on their tail it's almost like the iris sauron <laughs> you know like wow. it's, it's pretty cool and and they're really aggressive and uh, 
So we have we have what the I spot both in, um, and this is the easternmost part of their natural point of their natural range is Lake Champlain. Uh, same with wow. a lot of other species like the long nosed gar, freshwater drum, stir- lake sturgeon, muskie, bunch of other fish, and uh, and you know reptiles and amphibians as well. Uh, so it's kind of a natural break point, and we have a great population. You know they 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 get big. There's a lot of food with that lake level fluctuation you get a lot of these backwater wetlands so we have a lot of marshy and swampy areas and that's where bowfin really excel they do exceptionally well you know they 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 breathe air oh right yeah that's the unique thing because they're really are they kind of like an ancient a really ancient type fish compared to salmonids and other fish Absolutely. Uh, I've been calling them the most American game fish there is because they are unchanged for 300 million years. Right. Right. I mean, there is no wow. more American game fish than that. You know, take that largemouth bass. You know, right. <laughs> there yeah, you can, like who, no, there's not many fish that can breathe air, right? Right, right. But I mean, also unchanged for 300 million years. Like if you look in the fossil record and you see fossils of bowfin, yeah, it you know it's like it, it that's a bowfin. There's no question, you know. No kidding. So does that go back? I, I'm not good, real good with my geolo, you know, the the time and all that. But is that back like pre dinosaur, even before that's, dinosaur? That's the same time as T Rex. Oh yeah, right. Same time. Same time period as T Rex. So wow. they are they are unchanged, you know, for that long, right? And like. They're a survivor. You know, people talk about cockroaches, um, you know, making it through a nuclear holocaust. Right. Um, Bofin and gar are going to do it as well. I can, I can promise you that. Uh, you know, Bofin can be out of the water for about 24 hours without any ill effects. Jeez. Um, there was a documented case where in the Shedd Aquarium in, in uh, Chicago, somebody forgot one was in a tank in the, in the back room and they didn't feed it for a year and it was fine. What? Uh, yeah. So they're they're wow. just they're just total badasses. <laughs> they're, yeah. And so do they breathe? So they breathe air and do they breathe oxygen through the yes. water? Both. Both. Yeah. Like when they need it. So like it's one of the, and that's why why they're here because like in l- rough times environmentally they can just sit there and breathe air when they don't have the water quality sort of thing, right? Right. And and not only just water quality, but you know like any trout fisherman knows this: the the warmer the water is, the less oxygen it holds. Yeah. Right. So these these guys can, you know, when when the water gets like 80, 85 degrees and then, you know, shallows of, of Lake Champlain, you know, you're, you're where you're talking a dark, a dark bottom, less than two feet of water, lots of muck. Right. So you got all sorts of decomposing stuff, which is using up oxygen. That water's getting really hot from the sun. And, you know, there's still all sorts of stuff living back there, leeches and crayfish and, and small sunfish and you know, what a great way to take advantage of that. They go back in there and then, you know, they gulp air so they can keep going after whatever they want to eat. And they'll eat almost wow. anything. God, this is amazing. This is, yeah, you're, you're starting to paint the picture of what sounds like, like you said, this is like the fish species that everybody should be going for because right. it's so cool. Right. Do, you, do you know the, uh, like, what is the distribution of this fish? Do you know, is it uh, outside, is it east or where, where does it go? Is it everywhere? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll give you the dis- distribution of both both end species. So they're throughout the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi drainage, down into Florida, down into Texas. So east of the ca- east of the Rockies, east of the Rockies. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they've got a huge natural range. You know, they do better in some places than, than they do others. And there's kind of a, you know, a north south flip-flop between the two different species. Amia calva is kind of like Virginia and South. And then north of that is, is uh, Amia silicata. Uh, I haven't looked at the, the distribution maps to know that super well, but that's, that's basic. That's giving you like a general idea. Uh, a silicata, the I spot is, um, is more like Great Lakes and, and the Northeast and uh, Amia calva is, is South of that. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. And they're super cool fish. I mean, they've got, they've got a, a really strong jaw, a mouthful of teeth, but they're, they're not like cutting teeth, like a pike or a muskie. They're, they're conical teeth, kind of like a walleye. So you don't need to use a bite leader. Um, I, I had people who tell, you know, tell me that, Oh, you got to use a bite leader. You got to use a shock tip, but no, you don't. They're conical teeth. They don't cut the line. And I, you know, I know I've caught them on, you know, light tippet more than a few times and, and 
fine. You know, I'll be, you know, I typically fish light tippet for carp. And if I see a bowfin, you can just drop a, a, a fly in front of their face and they'll eat almost anything. And, um, and the method of, of, of fishing them is, you know, it's all sight fishing. Which, oh, which it is. is it's sight oh, fishing. Yeah. It's all wow. sight fishing. The way I do it is all sight fishing. Yeah, let's let's hear how you do it because this is sounding this is great. First of all, starting here, yeah. but uh, yeah, talk about how you sight fish and catch these by sight. So it's a super visual game. It's it's really fun. I so I used to guide out of a canoe. Now I guide out of a, a Toey River Master Calusa, and I push pull. And you don't really cast to them, um, so you're really just you're out hunting fish. You're stocking these fish in the shallows, and. You're looking for them, and they, they will come up to the boat. These things are really smart. People think bowfin are dumb because they will swim up to a boat, but they're curious, right? So they, they will swim up, then they're kind of they will look you in the eye. Oh, like wow. I, I joke you not, they will come right up. They will look at the boat. They will look at you, and people think they're dumb because they do that. But that's a sign of intelligence. Curiosity is intelligence, All right? right. Yeah. And uh, you know, people talk about how smart big brown trout are, and right. I love big brown trout. Big brown trout are not smart. They're selective. Yeah, and I've seen trout. I, I've seen salmon. You know, this is something funny I've seen. Like salmon trout hide their heads underneath the undercut bank while the rest of their body's sticking out. You know what I right. mean? Like, is that something a bowfin is a little bit smarter than that? Way smarter than that. So I, you know, I, I've I've worked with aquarium fish and and I've worked with both species. I've worked with, with trout and bowfin and aquariums, and I can tell you, trout are dumb. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I love trout. Don't, 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 you know, they hate on me, hate on me, but like trout are not smart. Both no. are wicked smart. Um, they figure things out. They know what's going on. Um, yeah. if you work an area too long, uh, you're using the same flies, they figure it out and they know, they know not to, you know, they know what's going on. They, they figure yeah. it out. But, uh, so when you're stocking the fish and, and I use like a fairly heavy rod, I like using like an eight rod, eight weight. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other people out there who like using a little bit lighter, six weight, seven, but yep. I, you know, I think it's a nine foot, eight weight, nine foot, eight weight is great. I, I don't even mind a shorter rod because the method you're not casting, uh, you're really dapping. I use a short leader, a short, heavy leader, you know, typically, you know, four feet, five feet of fluorocarbon, like 16 pound or 20 pound, uh, just a straight leader. I'm using uh, kind of a, I've got specialized flies that I use. I've got uh, this fly that's been deadly for me. I call it the Mr. Beauregard. The heavyweight fly on a short shank heavy wire hook. I'm using the, uh, the Kona Big Game Hunter um, with, with lead eyes and lead wraps. And, and basically, when you see the fish, you drop it right in front of their face and you kind of jig it. Um, and really, it, you know, bluntly, it is basically jigging with a fly rod, but it's, it's the stock, you know, people, people think, oh, well, this is, this isn't going to be very fun until you get into it where, where, you know, you and the angle, the guide and the angler are working as a team to spot these fish and then get the right presentation to them. I've also got a couple of techniques where I'll splash the water and the fish will come to the boat. And there's nothing quite like having six or eight bowfin circling your boat. Oh wow! Which is which is pretty intense. Uh, I mean, they they come up with with a malicious intent. Oh wow! <laughs> how, how big how big do bowfin get? Uh, typical fish on Lake Champlain is like twenty six to twenty eight inches. Oh wow! Yeah, that's nice. I saw one. Uh, I've seen multiples over thirty three. Uh, I saw one last summer. It was probably 35. Jeez. There's an episode I did, an episode of Das Boat that I did oh, yeah. a couple years ago with Blaine Chocolate and Oliver Nye. And Blaine hook, hooks this fish twice, right? So here, here's another great thing about Bofin, just another aside. Yeah. Bofin. So Bofin, they'll grab the fly. And it'll get out of their mouth and they'll come around. They'll come back around to see what it was. Oh, wow. Right. The very first time I guided Bofin, I've told this story a lot, but it's a great story. Like I'm in my canoe, we're in these cattails and we hit a Bofin with the canoe and it shoots out in front of us and then turns around and comes back to see what hit it. <laughs> and my client hooks into it and, you know, Bofin, 
I thought he hooked into it. And, and I've, I, I've had to think about this a lot because Bofin do this a lot. It, the Bofin took off, went under some lily pads and, you know, he thinks he's still got the fish on and the, the, the fly is actually hooked into a lily stem. So they'll grab a fly and they'll just hold on to it and then they'll let go of it. Right. You know, I've seen pike and muskie do the same thing where I've landed plenty of Bofin and they're not hooked. They're just, they've just been holding on to the fly. No kidding. They're not even hooked. They just, they just won't let it go. They don't. So they're not smart enough to realize it's a hook, obviously. Or, you know, like, you know, like I said, Pike and Muskie will do the same thing. I've talked to, to like Blaine Chocolate and, and Blaine's like, yeah, I've, I've seen muskies just, you know, as soon as you get them in the net, they open their mouth and just drop, the fly just drops out. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of those predators are like, I'm just holding on to, to my meal. You know, right. that, that's, that's what they do. And anybody who's fishing predators a lot, you're going to see that. It's kind of, it's, it's really cool. But both in are really, they're notorious for doing this. They'll go right into the lily pads, open their mouth, the fly will come out. You'll be hooked in a lily stem. You think you're still on a fish. You go up and you have to unhook it. Anyway, my guy unhooks that fish. You know, we get it unhooked from the lily stem and the fish is back again. So he, he, he hooks it another time and it still gets up. So, and, and it's not unusual for you to get multiple chances at Bofin. Like they'll miss the fly. They'll come back and see what's going on and get another shot at it. I've had a lot of people, Oh man, I missed it. And I'm like, let's just wait a minute. It'll come back. And they come back. Wow. So this is a little bit different than say, like if you were musky fishing or even pike, is it, do you have a lot more opportunities with Bofin? Absolutely. No question. No question. And, and, Generally, where when you find bowfin, you don't find, you know, you you find a lot of them in the same kind of habitat. As long as there's a lot of that habitat, sometimes you get like micro habitats, and you only get three or four that are in there. But if you have a really good lily bed or a really good cattail or reed section, you'll find a lot of them in there. Um, they love they love weeds. Yeah, um, they love weeds, and you know they're. Generally, I find them in anywhere from like a foot to three or four or five feet of water. So they're pretty accessible with a fly rod. You know, it's all water that you can pull in. Right. So you need a boat. For the most part, you need a boat. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've been able to get them on foot a few times. Most of the places that you find them, they're not really places you want to wade, especially in the middle oh. of summer. You know? Oh, right. So there could be some like what alligators or some stuff like that. Well, we don't have any alligators in Vermont. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. You're in Vermont. Yeah, no alligators. You know, that's right. Down south, uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend waiting for. Right. So, what are what are the what? It's the worst thing about the where you're at that time of year. You're gonna step in just muck. The waiting. Oh, I've right. done it before, and it's like every time you take a step, and you got swamp gas, and you just like you get all this crap, and you can't see what's going on. I mean, and you know. I'm not always psyched about being in the water with bowfin. Um, oh, right. You know, like because they're a little, they're a little too smart. They're smart and they're aggressive. Um, you know, like I was, I was telling you, that they're they're really aggressive, especially when they're when they're spawning. Um, I actually, I had one jump out at my my toey two years ago. It jumped out of the water guarding its babies, and it jumped at and bit at the bow of my boat. You know, wow. so this was, we ended up catching that fish. It was 22 inches long, right? So there's a 22 inch fish going after a 15 foot boat. So, you know, they're, they've got an attitude and, and when, when those things are on, like I said, they're, they've got a malicious intent to them. Um, you know, I don't want to put like a, you know, a, a human face on a fish, but when they're, when they're in hunting mode, they are, they're, they're yeah. focused. They look, when you look at them, I mean, they kind of look, you know, a little bit, kind of the salmoned body morphology, even the face, but I mean, they look different. I mean, that mouth and the eye, oh, yeah. it and, looks like a different kind of crazy uh, fish. Oh, yeah. You know, there, and there's a, there's a spark of crazy in their eyes, too. And the yeah. best part of them is the dorsal fin. It undulates. Oh, right. Yeah. Why is this? Yeah, it's got this giant door. It's not like a little dorsal. The whole dorsal fin's on the back. Right. And, it, and it's almost the whole length of the body. I'll probably people are more f familiar with snakeheads because you know snakeheads get a lot of press these days. Right. Why why is that? Why why does it what's the advantage of having a full length versus just like a salmon short small? You know, I think actually it's it's maneuverability, you know, that it just but the way it undulates, that's one of the ways that I can, you know, I know that they're about to grab the fly. Oh, you know, right. they'll, they'll come in and they'll look at the fly 
And all of a sudden the dorsal goes up and it undulates and then bam, and they hit it and they do a 180. And when they do that, there's this, it's, it's super cool. I've talked to other people who, who have heard this as well. And I always ask, you know, my clients, if they heard it, they, there's this, this audible whoop when they hit, because they hit so hard and fast. It's super cool. And they'll grab and they'll do a 180 and then they're, they take off. And if they've missed, they go out in the weeds and then they circle back and they come in from a different angle. It's no kidding. Oh yeah. They're smart. They know what they're up to. Yeah. yeah. And you're imitating, what are you imitating with the flies or certain species or just whatever? They eat almost anything. So, um, you know, I, I think I basically the fly is, is essentially a woolly bugger in a lot of ways, which is really imitative of a lot of things. It could be a dragonfly. It could be a damselfly. It could be a leech. It could be a crayfish. It could be, you know, who knows what. And, and those work really well. Uh, I've got another, another fly I, I call, uh, the, the bow jiggles. It's another, it's kind of a crayfish, more of a crayfish imitation. I've used, uh, game changers and changer craws really successfully. Although sometimes changer craws can be really challenging when you're doing the, you know, my, my dapping technique because the articulated body is really hard to get the hooks at. They've got a really bony jaw oh, right. and, and, uh, that articulation when you're that close, is really hard to get a good solid hook set, gotcha. um, you know, and that, cause you're really, you're not doing a strip set. You're really using the, the, the rod to just whack the fish. Yeah. It's, it's, it's totally different, man. It's, it's unlike any <laughs> yeah. other type of fly fishing you'll, you'll ever do. Wow. It's, that sounds awesome. So if somebody it's, was it's in that, fun. It's, if somebody was in the Northeast or could get up to that area, well, and again, it's not just the Northeast because they're all over the East, but right. if they, if they were in your neck of the woods, um, you know, Lake Champlain, what would be the, maybe just walk them through, like if they were out there in a boat, talk about that again, you find, so you find fish, what, how do you find them? First of all, you're looking for the weedy kind of mucky stuff on the edges. Yeah. Yeah. Lily beds and cattail beds and, you know, shallow weedy areas, you know, and, and you're just, you know, I just they're on the prowl most of the time. Um, sometimes they're just sitting, uh, they will just sit on the bottom and, and you can get them when you know, you got to know what you're looking for. Um, but i I find them, I've caught them as early as, you know, if you have a really, really er- warm spring and ice office has happened in March, I've found them in shallow backwaters in March. I tend not to find them much after labor day. So there's your, there's, time period between okay. really, really April, mid April till about early September. So that's kind of the hot, like, yeah, it's not the coldest time. They're not, at, where, where do they go in the cold? They just kind of hunker down or they're in the same spots. Um, I just, I, I don't know what it is. I just don't seem to be able to locate them after the beginning of September. Uh, I've looked, um, and, and I also have to admit that I don't spend tons of time at that point. I've, I've kind of got my bowfin fix and I start switching to other stuff. I, you know, I, that's, uh, my, the fall is when I start, um, developing my adipose complex and I start chasing yep. after trout right. and, uh, and, and, um, you know, I really, I mix things up. I like to mix things up. Uh, I like having different opportunities. Imagine embarking on a journey to Alaska, that ultimate destination for adventure seekers. With Fishhound Expeditions, this dream can become your reality. Picture yourself amidst the wild Alaskan landscape where the northern lights dance across the sky and you're reeling in some of the biggest rainbow trout you've ever seen. It's an experience that feels like a dream, but with Fishhound, it's an adventure waiting to happen. If Alaska is on your bucket list, Fishhound Expeditions is the key to unlocking that dream. Visit fishhoundexpeditions.com today and mention that you discovered them through this podcast. That's F-I-S-H-H-O-U-N-D, Expeditions. Don't just dream about Alaska, experience it with Fishhound. So if somebody was coming in to guide, like wanted to get a trip with you, you would probably say, yeah, sometime between April and September. Is there a yeah. prime time within that or is it all pretty much all good? May through August, you know, really. It depends on what you want. You know, numbers game, June, July, August. Uh, and, and some of your bigger fish are going to be then. If you want the colored up males, you got to do May, June. Uh, oh, and right. really That's the when color, they spawn? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the color is is spectacular. Real, they're 
they're genuinely a handsome fish. Most people don't think of bowfin as an attractive fish. You know, they're, you know, they're kind of olive and brown and, and, and I can understand that they're really purpose built though. You know, like if, if they haven't changed their, their basic form for 300 million years, something's, something's right there. Yeah, right? Something's you know, going good. Something, right. Something's going good right there. Yeah. And, you know, so they've got that, the olive and brown modeling and, you know, they're, they're perfectly camouflaged for the, the environment that they're in, right? Yeah. Um, gotcha. But but the males, when they are in spawning color, like there's no other freshwater fish that I know in this area that has such vibrant colors. You know, the, the forest green that's on their side is unbelievable. And the turquoise in their fins is spectacular. You know, like it, I would say it rivals like a really nicely colored up, pumpkin seed sunfish oh pumpkin seed right right which i think are super handsome fish you know like i i think the 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 three most colorful fish that we have in vermont are you know male brook trout in in spawning colors you you can't beat that a really nicely colored up pumpkin seed or a male bowfin they're they're all just fantastic colored gosh that's great what would be your you if you're thinking about bowfin again somebody's going out there what would be a you know, maybe a few tips you would tell them to help them maybe catch a bowfin, or is this is this pretty easy out there fishing for them if you can have a boat? Well, I wouldn't call it easy. Uh, you got to have the right boat. You got to know what you're doing. You got to know what you're looking for. Okay, and the right boat is a polling. Do you need a polling boat? I think so. You know, I did out of canoes for a long time. Uh, I think you can. You could. You could probably pull it off. You could definitely pull it off with a, with a, a canoe. There's people who do it in kayaks. Being able to stand up and see what's going on. So like even a stand up paddleboard, you can do it, but you're in, you're in the weeds. You got to be in the weeds to really get after it the best. So you got to be able to get through those weeds effectively. Um, so, you know, it's tough to push pull like a big, like a Lund or something like that. Mm, right. You yeah. can't get through the weeds very effectively. Can you find both in? Absolutely. Do I see guys uh, with spinning rods and bait getting both in and that stuff? Yeah, no question. But a vessel like a towy or or something similar to that can get into those environments with the stealth that you need. I mean, you know, they're they're like I've said that they're they're pretty badass fish and 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 they're not really afraid of much. However, the stealthier you can be, the more fish you're going to find. Gotcha. So you get so you go to an area you think, you know, you think there might be fish. You go in there, you find the fish, and you just kind of sit there and chill out and just. Oh no! No oh, no! I, I'm actively moving around. Oh, you I'm, are. I'm stalking the fish. Oh, right. Oh, I'm stalking the fish. So, how are you stalking them? So, how let's describe that. If you're if you didn't know the area and you're you're in your boat, how do you you know you're just going towards those areas you think are good, and then how do you stalk them? I'm push pulling through the weed beds. You know, like I'm going through the cattails. Uh, I mean, literally through the cattails or the reeds, uh, through the lily beds. Um, you know, looking for channels cause they're going to cruise those channels, but I'll go right into the, right into the stuff that people are like, you know, what are you doing in there? Um, you know, like where most boats can't go and that's where I'm finding them. Uh, they definitely like edges. Um, you know, they're going to like, like I said, channels, channels are great. You know, as, if you find shallow weedy areas, you're going to find the fish, um, you know, as long as they're there. Um, and there's definitely, um, I, you know, I will say this and I have a bone to pick with, with one style of fishing and and I've made no bones about this. (laughs) I've been very vocal about it. Uh, bow fishing sucks. And the fact that people go out and kill bowfin with a bow and arrow and just dump them in the woods is very popular here. People are doing it with, Why, why is that? Why, why is that popular? They just think they're like a junk fish or they're native fish, right? They're native fish. You can do it with carp. You can do it with gar. You can do it with bowfin. You can do it with pike. There's a bunch of different species. Uh, there's people who are guiding for it here. It's it's becoming an incredibly popular pastime, but genuinely, it's just killing for killing's sake. Yeah. Why why is that? What and so that's legal to do. You could actually just go kill fish without. It's it's totally legal. It's garbage. And there's a lot of people who like if you're not out if you're listening to this right now. And you're not outraged by bow fishing and what these people are doing, uh, you're you, you don't have a heart. Right. Um, and I know people, there's a lot of people who who um, 
give me all, all these arguments while I'm helping the bass population. Well, listen, buddy, um, the largemouth bass is not a native species to Lake Champlain. Hmm. No kidding. Plain and simple. You're, you know, you're not, you're not doing anything to help. The, and, and, you know, number one, number two, uh, every study that's out there shows that bowfin have no impact on largemouth bass. Right. So, you know, you're, you're just coming up with an excuse to keep doing what you're doing. Gosh. Um, you know, it's, it's really, you know, do a little research and, and bow fishing is an incredibly destructive, you know, quote, I hate using the term sport, but it's, you know, that's what it's called. You know, you, you, you'll see pictures of people down in Texas with like literally 50 or hundred alligator gar that they got in a night. Cause they're doing this at night under lights with a compound bow that has a laser sight that compensates for refraction. Oh man. It's wholesale slaughter. Right. And right. we're one of the few states, we, we have some progressive fisheries biologists here who have made a, uh, a five fish limit with bowfin and, and with gar. Uh, other states, there is no limit. It, for a long time, there was no limit. So you could go out and just kill as many as you want. And, and I find these things dumped at boat launches all the time. Yeah. And is it old fish? How, how old is that fish? If it's a 20, 30 inch fish, is it an old fish? Uh, it is. Um, bowfin are really long lived. Um, you know, 30 plus years. Right. Oh, wow. So yeah. So, so the fact that they, I mean, there's maybe a, well, they've been around forever, but yeah, I mean, this isn't helping their populations. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, are, uh, you know, is, is bow fishing going to ever eradicate the bow fin from Lake Champlain? No, you know, there's no question the, the lake is just big. They're not going to be able to access all the spots. They're never going to be able to get every one of these fish. However, um, one of the bays that I used to find, I'd go into this bay and, and I would find 50 or 60 bowfin a day. I go in there and I work hard for like six hours and I'll see one or two. And it's right next to one of the most popular boat launches for both guys, you know, and, and I've seen them in there at night, you know, and they're hard to miss. There's 10 to 20 million candle watts of light in the front of their boat with a generator going. And typically, you know, a bunch of rednecks heap, you know, hooting and hollering with bad pop metal playing. <laughs> you know, it's wow. just like it's the that's rough you know like yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm i'm definitely yeah. i'm painting these guys as as you know uh. jerks but i mean and they're doing it right next, right where you know people have nice homes on lake champlain and they're literally doing it right in their back in their front yards oh, so it's man. kind of just it's, it's it's lame on so many different that ways. is that is you know, and, and, and sorry for, you know, taking the, this in that. No, direction, no, no. But, I think it's a valid point. I think it's, people should know about this. People should know about this. And, and if you're, <laughs> if you're any kind of angler that, that practices catch and release and, and has respect for the, for your quarry. And, and I have no problem with people taking fish. And if you're going to consume a fish and you want to take a meal, if you are, are, are doing, you know, a, a, a reasonable harvest, right? And you're utilizing that fish. I got no problem with that, right. especially if there's plenty of them around. If you're just killing for killing's sake and dumping those things in the woods or using oh, them right. for compost, it's not okay, especially no. if it's a native species. Yeah, exactly. And, and are these fish, uh, can you eat these fish? From what I understand, so, you know, one of my, I'm allergic to fish, so I, I can't eat the fish, but, um, from what everybody I've talked to has said about both in their flesh is mushy and it tastes like mud. Yeah. So yes, you can sense. eat them, but do you want to eat them? Right. Right. You know, so it's, it's one of those things like this is in, in a lot of ways, you know, you got this, this great native species. that's a hard fighting fish. That's fun to, to target and they're not, you know, super edible. This is a great catch and release fish. Yeah, it is. You know, perfect. It, it does, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Wow. So this is, so basically you have some impacts going on, but overall, I mean, if people were to go out there, they could probably find some of these fish and anything else you want to talk about as far as helping somebody, if they wanted to dig into this and maybe, you know, had the right a boat or, you know, they're out there. What else would you tell somebody to help them find some fish or have we covered most of everything here? Hot days. Oh, hot they days. like it hot. Oh, wow. um, and, um, like I said, they breed air. So when they come up and gulp, you found a fish. Oh, right. And you can, and I, and I will, I will, that's one of the things I love. If I, if I've got a super hot day, I see a gulp. I'm after it. Oh, so you can see head almost like, yeah, you can see oh. the head and you could right away know how big it is kind of roughly. Well, you know, so they don't, it's, you, you, can't, you don't really get an idea of the size from the gulp, but you, you see the gulp. So you, you know, like, yeah. And you know, the fish is there. 
and you can get over and get in that general area and find them and find them. And then and that how so if you see a gulp, you kind of get over to the area and then ha- and then you're just looking for them and then you spot them. Right. Right. It takes a while to, f- to figure out how to spot them. You know, like sometimes they'll come in hot. Um, and I love it when they come in hot, they'll come in as, as, as I see this, especially with like smaller, like younger bowfin, especially younger male bowfin, they'll come in like they're, they're wiggling their whole body and they're flaring their gills and they're just trying to look really big and angry. And they come right up to the boat like that. And, <laughs> and that's a lot of fun. Cause you know, there's, here's this fish that's just like, I'm ready to go. You know, like that's, that's the attitude they've got. They're coming up, they're looking for a fight. And that's a lot of fun. But other times you'll get them and they'll just come in real sneaky. And you have to like, you won't, you won't, you know, they're coming through lilies. So you'll just, you know, you'll see just like a fin or you see their dorsal, you see their nose coming through. And, and I can definitely pick them out real easy because you get this round face that comes out and they've got tubercles that come out of their nose, right? So they've got these tubercles that, that help them with scent. Oh, you mean like a, like a catfish sort of thing? Well, not like whiskers. No, they're not like whiskers. They're, so uh, imagine like elongated nostrils. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it, you know, you look at on look at a picture of a bowfin online. You'll see, you see the tubercles, and and when they if they're coming directly at you, you uh, they look like they're smiling. It's it, it's you know if they're coming head on, it looks like they have a smile. Yeah, and and, uh, and I think that's where their Latin name Amia comes from. Um, because you know, they, they look like they're friendly, um, you know, but it's, it's definitely a crocodile smile. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They do have a little bit of that, that face too. Yeah. Kind of the, the croc or some sort of a, yeah, that type of predator a little bit. Oh yeah. And they are, they, they are an amazing predator. They are, an, they'll eat almost anything. You know, uh, one of the favorite baits of, 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 uh, bait guys around here is hot dogs. Well, it's like cheap hot dogs. Um, they'll come in for that, but you know, they'll eat fish. Um, I've caught, you know, every now and then you'll get, you'll get a pike that takes a you know, fly deep and you put it back and you hope the best for it, but it bellies up. Uh, I remember a few years ago putting, you know, like a, it was about a 22 inch pike, uh, and I put it back and I was like, you know, I hope it makes it. And I came back in that same area about 15 minutes later, two thirds of that thing was gone. And it's, no way. Oh, oh yeah. The bowfin had got to it. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got a video on my Instagram from last spring that's really cool. They are serious predators on bullhead catfish. And um when the uh bullhead are bedding, because they 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 dig these nests and they'll pair up and they they lay their eggs and they guard their their eggs and babies for about a month in like May, June. And right after that's right after the the bowfin have spawned, right? And the, the the males are guarding the nest, but the females who tend to be the bigger fish are out and they're hungry. They're really really hungry. And for for a long time, I was finding just bullhead heads. Like it would be it would be a, a pretty good sized bullhead. We're talking you know like a, a ten to thirteen inch bullhead. But it would be chewed off right behind the dorsal and pectoral fins, which are, you know, their spines, right? And I was like, what is going on here? And then I found a bowfin with one in its mouth and, and it had grabbed it and it had swallowed it tail first. So what's going on is these bowfin are grabbing, they're grabbing bullhead and they're turning them around in their mouth. And getting up, getting, you know, swallowing it to the spines, which they can't get in their mouth and then just biting onto them and doing this, this crocodile death roll until the head of the fish breaks off. Oh my God. Wow. (laughs) And so so they're not, they're not, they're not T-boning them and then coming back and eating them from the head first. They're they're just eating them from the back, the tail, just until they're dead. They're T-boning them. Oh, they are T-boning. And then they're turning them, you know, around and eating them tail first. The tail first. Oh, wow. And, you know, I, I, I've got a video of, of a, uh, a bowfin from last spring that's got the, uh, the bullhead in its mouth. Okay. Are those video, what, what's your, what's your website again? What are those? Do you right, have well, that's video? on my Instagram. That's uh, it's masterclass angling. And, um, but I, I've, I actually witnessed a, um, a bowfin attacking 
a bullhead like that uh, a couple of years ago too. So it's it's a real thing. It's it's super cool. Like I said, these these guys are are pretty serious predators. Wow. This and, sounds awesome. <laughs> they are. They're really <laughs> sounds like fun. Out. And then you have everything else. I mean, today we probably won't get into all the other species, but you've got a bunch out there, including you mentioned some lake trout, pike. Maybe just do a, a quick run through some of the list of the other species that oh, you could catch I'll, out there. I'll give you a, a, a pretty much a full rundown. We got uh, an amazing smallmouth bass fishery, largemouth, walleye, uh, yellow perch, white perch, pike, pickerel, musky. Uh, pike pickerel hybrids, great salmon, uh, landlocked salmon fishing, lake trout, uh, there's brook trout, there's brown trout, long nose gar, freshwater drum. Freshwater drum are a lot of fun. Right. Uh, they fight really, really hard. Right. Um, pumpkin seed, bluegill, pumpkin seed, bluegill hybrids. Oh, Snakehead? Uh, we do not have snakeheads. I hope they never get in the lake, but that's yeah, a possibility. Oh, you know, uh, let me see. What else do we have? You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna miss a bunch of stuff. There's there's a lot of different species. Like I said, we've got 80, 87 or eighty eight species of fish in the lake. Uh, we've got we've got rud, which is an invasive species. We've got this other fish called a tench, which is another invasive species. It's kind of like a it's an unnatural. It looks like an unnatural cross between a smallmouth and a carp. Uh, they're super spooky. I haven't dialed them in yet, um, but they uh when i've hooked into them uh they they go off like like crazy they've got a really they got a serious outboard on them they get a really big dorsal fin or not dorsal uh, um caudal fin uh and they really take off yeah i mean it's 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 an amazing mixed bag fishery that that's got just a ton of opportunities and if you hit it right you know i've 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 gone from fishing bowfin to fishing lake trout in 15 minutes you know, um, and I don't, I, I don't know if there's any other place in the world that you can do something like that and have genuine odds of catching both. I've gone from, you know, catching long nose gar to catching lake trout in right. 15 minutes, Gosh. you know, what do people, when they're coming in to, uh, you know, if they call you and they say, you know, they're not quite sure, what do you tell them if they're saying they want to, or maybe they're going to be in the area for some other reason and they want to go fishing. What do you typically tell them? Well, I mean, you know, I check my availability first um, because uh, you know, Lake Champlain is big. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a big lake. Things can go really wrong uh, really quickly on this lake. Are there, are there other, you see a lot of people fly fishing out there? When I first started fly fishing in the lake, there was almost nobody. Now I'm seeing it pretty frequently. Uh, there's definitely, it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, when I first started guiding the lake uh, in 2008, there really wasn't anybody else who was guiding on the lake. And, and I think at this point I'm the only fly fishing guide with a uh, captain's license who act guides the lake. It's becoming more popular with a lot of people. And, and, and I, you know, it's great that it's getting the press that it's been getting and, and, and seeing people experiencing it, you know, like I fish with a lot of the guys from Orvis. Um, I'm yeah. very fortunate, you know, I'm, that's right. Tom Rosenbauer is a good friend of mine. And, yep. and, and until Tom and I started fishing together, he'd really never spent any time on the lake. And it's, and it's so accessible by so many people, you know, where it's, you know, an hour to two hours from Montreal. It's right. Uh, How close is it to the Orvis? What, what town is the Orvis, uh, kind of the main headquarters in? In Manchester. Yeah. Manchester, from, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what part of the lake you're going to, you know, 120 miles long, he, they can get to the, southern end of the lake in about 45 minutes they go oh, to the wow. northern end of the lake it takes about three hours but it's it, we're super close to new york city you know it's four hour drive five, five hour drive uh it's about three hours from boston so really close to a lot of different places and to really see lake champlain and fish lake champlain you need to have a good boat uh you can do it by canoe and kayak or, or stand up paddleboard but you really have to watch the weather um, and, and be super cautious. There's not a lot, unfortunately, there's not a ton of places that you can, you can get on the shore and, and, and have success. There's a few, but they're few and far between. Yeah. Like the one you said, you mentioned the, uh, the Island, the Grand Isle. Yeah. Grand Isle. I mean, there, there are places, there's some beaches that you can get in and there's some causeways and there's definitely a few places, but to really 
to really e- experience the best fishing, uh, you, you need to be in a watercraft. And, and I've tried, you know, I didn't have a boat when I first started and, and I definitely fished the shoreline and I did all right. You know, I caught, I caught plenty of fish and there's great tributaries. There's a, t- a ton of great tributaries with a lot of, a lot of opportunities. I mean, we get the, the smallmouth, we get, a, we get runs of smallmouth out of uh, Lake Champlain in, in May. And, uh, you know, you can have a day filled with, of, of walk and wade, um, filled with like three to five pound smallmouth, no problem. Oh, wow. God, that's right. What, what is uh, Lake Champlain? I mean, it's a well-known name. What, what, what do you think it's most known for up there? What, what is the reason people are going there? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, it's a, it's a great lake for boating and sailing, um, obviously for fishing. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a great place for sightseeing. It's just a, it's a beautiful lake. But, you know, people are coming here to fish. It really depends on, you know, what you're, you're looking at. Um, there's tons of bass tournaments on this lake. Tons. It's, it's, it's been one of the top five bass lakes in the country by bass masters for the oh, past that's right. something years. Yeah, that's right. So it's got an amazing population of, of it, you know, it's, mo- it's mostly a smallmouth lake, but it's got some great largemouth on it too. Uh, you get a lot of people, there's a lot of charter captains that, that do lake trout and salmon. They troll and jig for them and, and do really well. So a lot of people come in for that. Um, and and I'll, be, I'll be straight up here. I've really been pushing the bowfin and gar and all this oddball stuff. And, and I have a lot of people who come to me specifically for that. Uh, yeah. I have a couple of clients that have been chasing IGFA record bowfin with me for years. And if you look at the tippet class records on IGFA for bowfin and you see Richard Hart uh, and Lake Champlain, that's a fish that was caught with me. Um, and he's got, I, he's got uh, every tippet class record for bowfin on, on, on IGFA. And he's got the, uh, the, Catch and release bowfin on a fly world record. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And that was with me. I think <laughs> that was actually the same fish that Blaine hooked into. Oh, no kidding. And that was that 33 inch or something like that? Well, I think it's, I saw it this past summer. I think it's about 35 right now. Oh, right. Yeah. That's the other cool thing about them for the most part, unless some of those bow and arrow guys get out there. You got these fish are going to be there for the rest of your life, probably. Right. Right. Some of them and, and they're, they're huge. This, we, we had, we had, uh, right over Labor Day, we had 95 degree weather for like three days and it was the most insane bowfin fishing I've ever seen in my life. It was crazy. Uh, my bu- buddy Rowan Little who guides in Connecticut came up and, and fished with me and it was just like, we must've seen, I, I don't know, a hundred or more bowfin in, in an afternoon. They were just everywhere. You know, so we'd have three or four around the the the, the boat at any one time. <laughs> it, yeah, was that was it was great. It was great. What is the bowfin? If you had to say a category of fish, you know, it's so unique. We're talking about it here, but what would be other fish? What what category would that be considered? Like you got the trout and all that. Is it you know? Is there a is it under a certain order, or are there any other fish like it? So it's um it's a primitive fish. It's actually not one of the modern fish. It's 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 uh it's not uh Yeah, do you have any possible. other primitive fish other than that that you're yeah. you're catching out there? Uh long nose gar. Um we get we get big long nose gar, you know, over fifty inches is is not unusual. Uh you know, as far as other primitive fishes in the lake, we've got uh there's lake sturgeon, which you really can't target on a oh, fly right. and, and technically you're not supposed to target because they're an endangered species. And, um, the other primitive fishes are fishes that people don't necessarily like. Uh, we got, uh, we've got four species of lamprey in, in the lake. Mm. Uh, so we've got, we've got the sea lamprey, um, which may or may not be a native species. That's, uh, that's up for argument. There's a silver lamprey, which is definitely a, a, a native species. And then we've got, uh, the American brook and, uh, what's the other one? There's two brook lampreys, which are non parasitic oh, yeah. They're, right. they're small fish. They're pretty cool little fish. Right. And people don't like lamprey? Well, people don't. So one of the big problems we had with uh, with lake trout um, and salmon when they first started stocking them in the lake, you know, you're putting like – you're putting a million lake trout and like 500,000 salmon and, and, and uh, brown trout and steelhead in the lake every year. And you're doing that for, you know, decades. All of a sudden, the wounding rate 
from lampreys explodes. You know, there's pictures of of, of uh, lampreys from or of uh, lake trout from Lake Champlain with like three or four lampreys on them. Oh, right, because they're they're basically living on the fish while they're right. In the they're parasitizing lake. the fish, right? Yeah, and so. Lakers weren't getting very big and, and salmon weren't getting very big. And you were seeing, you know, I think it was like 50 to 70% of those fish had wounds on them. So, uh, so, but it's a, you know, like people complained about the lamprey at the same time you were feeding the lamprey. It's a classic part of prey relationship. Right. You're giving them the stuff. You're, you're feeding them. So the population explodes and then then you're like, why do all our fish have bite marks on them? Well, you know, like it's, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, we do have a really effective uh, sea lamprey control population. There's a way to to um, to deal with the amicetes. The amicetes are a uh, filter feeding uh, larvae that lives in the stream sediments for for four to seven years before they become a parasite and go into lakes. So there's a lamprey you can put into tributaries that will will kill the amicetes or uh, you know, yeah kill the amicetes um, in the stream bed. Which knocks down the population, which which is a big help. And we, the wounding rates are really low now. Uh, you certainly are going to get fished with those. But you know, lamprey overall are not they're not a dangerous fish. Uh, it's funny. I I did uh, I guided Jeremy Wade for an episode of uh, of River Monsters. Oh yeah. Um, and and the 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 uh, uh, the episode is all on lamprey. And uh, uh, you know, and there's a, there's this guy who is who's a who's a long distance swimmer who's, who tells this story about this lamprey that attacks him. And yeah, they'll, they'll come up and they'll attach to you, but they're not going to try to eat you. Right. Uh, and they're, they don't get very big, you know, a, a really, really big one in Lake Champlain is like 26 inches. Most of the time they're like 20 to 22 at most, but they, they have really primitive eyes. They see something dark swimming over them and they just come up and stick to it. They stick to boats all the time. Oh yeah. You know, so they're not, they're not, you know, one, and once they realize that they can't eat you, they drop off, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but uh, yeah. So, you know, lamprey definitely have had an impact on, uh, on sport fish. Um, But it doesn't seem to be impacting. And what's really interesting. And I've noticed this, and I've talked to other anglers who've noticed this wounding rates that I see lampreys, uh, and lamprey scarring on stocked lake trout, but I'm not seeing it on the wild lake trout. So uh, I think we're going to start seeing a, a better balance uh, between lamprey control and uh, and the wild lake trout population. You're going to, I think it's going to come back into balance, which is super cool. Amazing. <laughs> you know, it is really amazing. amazing. This is great. No, I'm glad we went down that road. Well, as we take it out here, maybe as we look back at this, any other, uh, you know, tips you would think of maybe as kind of takeaways from, you know, fishing, we're talking about fishing for both in kind of these primitive fish. What would you tell somebody to be, you know, the takeaways from today? Well, you know, open your mind and, and, and look at, at oddballs. Um, you know, you, ha- the, most people have a ton of different fish species, uh, available, uh, to, to catch right in your backyard that you might not necessarily be aware of as a fly angler. You know, the fly angling is so salmonid focused, uh, which is, which is fine. I mean, that's how we, we got going and, and that's what a lot of the industry is, is, is available. You know, that's, that's what the industry is focused on. However, you know, that pond around the corner is probably loaded with bluegill or, or, or pumpkin seeds or, or, you know, bullhead. Bullhead takes flies. I love catching that on a fly. And, and channel cats will take flies. And you've got all these different fish species that if you modify your technique, you're going to be able to get those fish. And you know what? Like, hey, maybe you like taking, like taking off in the weekend and going up in the mountains and catching trout. But, hey, you get done work and you want to catch some fish. Why not just go catch some bass or or the bowfin, yeah. the gar right that there. are right there in your backyard that you don't have yep. to travel two hours to go get. Exactly. You know, and, and and the techniques that you learn doing that will also help improve your trout fishing. They may not be you might you might not be dead drifting, but you know, you're stripping a streamer, stripping a streamer, stripping a streamer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. uh, you're gonna improve how you cast. And, and you'll become a more rounded angler and, and you'll, I think you'll appreciate where you live. You know, that's one of the great benefits right, that of COVID. COVID all forced us all to fish locally, right? Yeah. People right. couldn't travel. So, you know, a lot of people have discovered, hey, I got these opportunities right here. Yeah. Why not take advantage of them? That's awesome. Right. 
Perfect, Drew. Well, I think we'll leave it there. This has been awesome. Uh, I think you've done a great job shedding light on the Bowfin. I think I'm sure a lot of people are interested now to, you know, not only that, but also just get out there and check out all the species, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate all your time today and definitely hope to connect with you down the line. Fantastic. Thanks a million, Dave. That is a wrap. You can grab all of the show notes at wetflyswing.com. And please follow us on Instagram and share this episode out with someone you love. Please send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com, if you have any feedback or want us to put together an episode on this podcast for you. Check in anytime. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and would love to meet up with you on the water. We have new fly fishing schools going all year long and all around the country, so if you want to connect, let's do it right now. All right, time to get out of here. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping by and checking out the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.